Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day today. Apologies in advance for the background noise. It's actually raining. It's pouring down here in Brisbane, which we love. I love rain and I feel like it really gets me in the mood to like sit down and just hang out and chat with you guys. So let's get into it. Today's case is a solved one and it is about a woman who fell in love with the wrong man and the way that this case was solved is actually really interesting i have never seen anything like it before before we get into it i just quickly want to thank today's sponsor case to five for making this video possible i am so incredibly grateful to have been working with one of my favorite brands for so long now and i am so so grateful for their support of my mystery monday series over the years it's honestly not hard to tell why i am so obsessed with case to five cases their impact cases and ultra impact cases are made of 65% recycled materials and the packaging that all of their products come in is made from 100% recyclable material and the packaging itself is made from recycled paper and non-toxic soy ink. Their cases are approved for drops of up to 9.8 feet. They are wireless charging and 5G compatible and despite that they're still really thin and cute unlike a lot of other protective phone cases which are really just like clunky and ugly and they also have an antimicrobial coating which kills 99% of bacteria they're also non-toxic and non-hazardous and they have so many different types of cases there's so many different prints they're customizable these are the four cases that I have on rotation at the moment aren't they beautiful so if you guys are interested in checking out any of the case to buy cases you can head to case to buy com slash Bella to get 15% off your order so make sure you check that out I will leave all of the information in the description down below and speaking of cases let's get into today's case so in 1995 Louise Ellis was 46 years old and she was a writer illustrator and justice advocate living in Ottawa which is in Canada she was a beautiful woman who was known to have a great sense of humor she was intelligent she was artistic she was a feminist and she was known to be a really friendly person who had a lot of friends and a lot of passions she was very much into gardening and tai chi and obviously writing and drawing she started writing her first book when she was in university and she also got into illustrating and she would draw pictures with dots like she would use a bunch of little dots to create an image she also worked for a children's magazine called chickadee and she was also creating murals in schools and she would have the children participate in creating these artworks which is super cute and she was also working as a freelance writer for the Canada Post annual yearbook and then by 1992 she was also working on a novel about David Milgard and David Milgard was a man that had been wrongly convicted of rape and murder and he actually spent 23 years in prison for a crime he did not commit so she was a part of this David Milgard support group and she was also writing the novel about him so she would go to some of the Supreme Court hearings for his trial to prove his innocence to collect data and that sort of thing and in 1992 when she was at one of these Supreme Court hearings there was this guy who took the stand his name was Brett Morgan and he basically ratted out his cellmate a guy named Larry Fisher on behalf of David Milgard and said that his cellmate had confessed to killing a woman that someone else was doing time for and Louise was really into that. She admired him for coming forward and helping David out and risking being known as a snitch for doing so. So as Brett was being led out of the courtroom in handcuffs, Louise was like, hey, can I talk to him real quick? And she just told him that she thought what he was doing was really courageous and admirable. And they started sort of writing to each other in prison. She was writing to him in prison and they ended up starting up a romantic relationship. Over the next two years, while they 
continue to write to each other, Louise actually started to help him try and get released from prison early so that they could, you know, start a, a life together, they could be together in person. And they were very, very different people. Louise, you know, she was described as this intelligent, well-educated woman, while Brett was described as a blue-collar guy, he had a hard life, he'd been physically abused growing up and had gotten into drugs and he was actually in jail for strangling a prostitute to death in Edmonton in 1978 while he was high on cocaine and he'd only been charged for manslaughter he'd been sentenced to 10 years but he only ended up serving eight years in prison because like I said Louise had paid for good lawyers to get him out two years early so he was released in 1994 and as soon as he was released he moved in with Louise they continued their romantic relationship and she really helped to get him back on his feet she bought him a truck she bought him business supplies so that he could start up a new business she really did everything for him and then nine months later she went missing so on Saturday the 22nd of April in 1995 at around 1 or 1 15 p.m. Louise left Ottawa and she drove to the Gatineau Hills in Quebec which is about a 15 to 20 minute drive and she was going there to visit her ex-boyfriend which was a guy named John and his daughter they had an on again off again relationship but after she started seeing Brett they called it quits for good but they remained really good friends and she was also friends with John's daughter as well and the weekend of the 22nd was his daughter's birthday so Louise was going to visit them to celebrate her birthday but unfortunately she never made it to his cottage. The next day on the afternoon of Sunday the 23rd of April Louise's friend found her car on the side of the road in the Gatineau Hills near where John's cottage was located all of the car's doors were locked and there were no signs of a struggle or anything like that. All of her belongings were still in the car. So in the back seat was her overnight bag, which had her pajamas. It also had a book of horses, which she had signed the front cover of because she was going to give it as a gift to John's daughter for her birthday. And then in the front passenger seat was her purse, which still had her bank cards, her license, her ID, all of that sort of stuff in there. So it seemed like the car had been abandoned so Louise's friend who had discovered the car called Brett and Brett then called the police and the police alongside you know Brett some of Louise's friends and family came out to search the surrounding area near where her car was found they searched the bushes, they searched the rivers, but they found no trace of Louise whatsoever. So Brent decided to print out some missing persons posters with Louise's photo on them. He handed them out, he posted them up everywhere, and he also went to the location every day, all day, where her car was found. And he would just stand there and he would stop every single car that drove past to ask them questions, if they had seen anything if they recognized the car you know he would show them the missing persons posters of Louise and he also did some interviews uh, in the media to get the word out and he was saying you know I have to bring her home he said he was feeling increasingly terror filled and he genuinely seemed so devastated about the disappearance how are you feeling increasingly terror filled I have a criminal history but I would never do anything to harm her. Obviously, being a convicted murderer and Louise's boyfriend, the police questioned him and he was very open with them. He answered all of their questions and he tried to help them out however he could. He was very upfront with them. He told them, yeah, look, I killed a hooker in 1978 and I was high on cocaine and Louise helped me get out of prison early. And the police gave him the benefit of the doubt because he was the one who reported her missing. He had been searching for her all of this time. Louise had helped him get out of prison early. She had paid for his truck. She had paid for his tools. She had really helped him get set up after prison and get back on his feet. So he really had no reason to kill her. And police also were being kind of cautious because they can often be criticized in these sort of cases for 
getting tunnel vision. They didn't have any evidence against him at this point. There was nothing to indicate that he had killed Louise. So they wanted to continue their investigation and explore other possibilities. Meanwhile, while the police investigation is ongoing, this woman named Marie Perrant has been watching this case unfold in the media. And she's been following it pretty closely. She had moved from Scotland to Canada two years prior to train to be a private investigator because she wanted to help women. She was very passionate about that. And while this whole case was unfolding, she's actually looking to get some practice as a PI, get out there, get on her first case after training for the past few years. And she had seen Brett's interviews. She felt really bad for him. And she also lived in Gatineau. So she lived about 25 minutes away from where Louise's car was found. And she managed to get a hold of Brett and, you know, talk to him on the phone and said she wanted to help out and help him find Louise. And he said, great, let's meet tomorrow. So the next day she goes to his house and when she gets her, he sits her down, he holds her hand and he says, thank you so much for helping me try and find Louise. And she asks if she can record the rest of the conversation. And he says, of course, no problem. And then he goes on to tell her about Louise, about the case. He tells her, She's all I have. I can't give up. I have to find her because we are soulmates. I can't do this alone. I can't be without her. And so Marie tells him, you know, it's okay. We're going to find her. I am going to help you find Louise. My hope is the same as I'm sure everybody's is that yeah, we find, find Louise safe and sound Me somewhere. Too. I can't give up. I can't. You know, I mean, she's all I have in my life. It's, it's very hard to have. <laughs> very alone. So she goes and starts doing some investigating of her own and she goes to the area where Louise's Jeep was found and her car was found kind of at the bottom of a driveway up to somebody's cottage and nobody was able to talk to the people who lived at that cottage because nobody was home. It was late April. A lot of these cottages were still empty from the winter time. Louise's Jeep itself was basically pulled in, situated right where this the spot is. And the Jeep was actually pulled in right into the edge, very well parked. So Marie just kind of looked at the car and where it was located and the more she looked at it and the area that it was left in, the more she started to come up with this theory that somebody who wasn't Louise had parked it there deliberately, locked it and then left to kind of either throw police off or to just get rid of the car after abducting her. And she believed that this had to have been somebody that Louise knew. It wasn't a random, it wasn't a stranger, it was somebody who was in her life. So she talks to Brett again to kind of get an idea of anyone in Louise's life who may have had a motive to want to kill her. And that is when Brett tells her that he's kind of sus on her ex-boyfriend John. She had been going to visit him the day that she disappeared and so he was looking pretty sketchy. He told Marie that John and Louise actually had a very abusive relationship when they were together and that John was probably not happy when she moved on with Brett and he likely wanted Louise to leave Brett and it was also pretty sus that she had been going to visit him the day she disappeared. So he had the opportunity, he had the motive and Marie was starting to think that maybe John had something to do with her disappearance. And the police, they don't know about Marie. They haven't heard of her. They don't know she's investigating the case as well as a private investigator but they have the same idea as her. They think, you know, John's looking a little bit weird. They had spoken to Brett and Brett had told them that the day that she disappeared, she was on her way to see her ex-boyfriend, John, and her car was found within a really close proximity of his cottage. So it's just looking a little weird. They want to go and talk to him and they go to John's workplace, ask him some questions. He gives them an alibi and his alibi is that he was at his cottage all weekend with his daughter. Just not really much of an alibi, especially considering her car was found within a really close proximity of his cottage. So police decide to go and search the area surrounding his cottage and they find nothing. 
no trace of Louise, no trace of anything, so there is absolutely no evidence to connect him to the disappearance. So the next person the police decide to look into in their investigation is Larry Fisher, who, if you remember, is the guy that Brett ratted out, saying that he was actually the one responsible for the rape and murder that David Milgard had been wrongfully convicted of. So Larry is obviously a violent guy. He's been violent towards women. He has raped and killed a woman previously, which which Brett ratted him out for at the trial, but Larry wasn't actually arrested for the crime until 1997. So at the time of Louise's disappearance in 1995, he was not in jail and he obviously would have been pissed off at Brett for ratting him out. And so the police's theory is that Larry may have potentially abducted and possibly even murdered Louise in order to get back at Brett for testifying against him. He's made threats uh, towards me before. So they look into where Larry was on the day Louise disappeared, the day of the 22nd of April, and they find that at 6, 10 a.m. he was actually stopped at a road stop in Saskatchewan, which basically ruled him out. So detectives are back to square one, and so they start looking in to Brett again. And they find out that he actually owed Louise over $20,000 which I'm assuming is for the truck and the business supplies that she must have loaned him that money to get him off his feet rather than, you know, just outright buying him the equipment. And she was really stressed out about this money too. Like, I guess he had told her that he was going to pay her back sometime soon. So she had been calling the bank about four to five times a day being like, hey, has the money come through? Has he paid yet? Has the money come through? And obviously it never came through because he never paid her. They also found out that Brett had actually been forging Louise's signature. So he would write a check from from Louise to himself, just straight up stealing her money. And Louise had no idea that he was doing this. So she would often call the bank like super pissed off because she thought it was the bank messing up. So the bank looked into it and found out it was actually Brett making these transactions and sending the money to himself by forging her signature on checks. So the police theorized that Louise found out about this and she threatened to contact his parole officer or contact the police about this and he couldn't have that. He'd just gotten out of jail nine months prior, so in order to stay a free man, he decided to kill her. To make matters worse, police were looking through Louise's bank transfers and if you remember, she was said to have left her property at 1 to 1.15 p.m. on the 22nd of April to go to her ex friend John's house and it was actually Brett who gave police that information. He told them what time she left and where she was going. That was Brett's doing. And if you remember, her car was also found with her bank card inside her locked car. But in looking through her bank transactions, police found that she supposedly made a withdrawal of $280 at 2.53 p.m. that day. So police go and they get the surveillance footage from the teller where that withdrawal was made and the person withdrawing that money was Brett. So according to Brett, she had left at 1 to 1.15 p.m. She had obviously taken her bank card with her because it was found locked in her car, but somehow two hours after her disappearance, he had used her card to withdraw money. So he was caught in a straight up lie, caught in 4K. Unfortunately though, that is not enough to arrest or convict him. Now, while this is going on, Marie Perrant, the private investigator also has a breakthrough. She was listening to the recording of the first conversation she had with Brett. And she notices that when she asks him if, you know, Louise's driver's side seat was the same as when Louise drove it, or if it looked like it had been pushed back, like a man or someone bigger than Louise had driven it. Because obviously, you know, her theory at the time was that somebody that Louise knew had deliberately driven the car there to stage it, to throw police off. So Brett's response was actually, oh no, it's exactly the same way that I, and then he stops, he pauses and he corrects himself. He says, it's the exact same way that Louise left it when she left home. She didn't notice it at first when they first had the conversation, but listening to it back, she's like, 
oh my goodness, is this guy that I've befriended, this guy that I'm trying to help, is he actually the murderer? Now by this point, Brett is the police's prime suspect. So they bug his house, they also get surveillance out front of his house to just kind of keep an eye on him. And that's when they overhear him talking to the private investigator, Marie Perron. And they look into her, they find out she's a private investigator, she's relatively new, this is her first case. And they decide to go and have a chat with her and they ask her, you know, what have you found out so far? Do you have any information? What are your theories? And she tells them, I think he's killed her. So interestingly enough, they actually ask her to help them out. They're like, obviously he trusts you. You've kind of befriended him. You're helping him out. So maybe because he trusts you, you can get a confession out of him. So it's a very unique situation to be putting this woman and asking her to get close to this man who has already been convicted of murder. They believe he has committed another murder of, you know, both women. And now they're asking another woman to get close to him, to get him to confess. It's very interesting. I've never heard of another case similar to this. And Marie is completely down. When they ask her to help them figure out what happened to Louise, she tells them, I'll do you one better and I will find the body. So they set up this plan that Marie is going to try and use Brett's attempts to cast blame on Louise's ex-boyfriend, John, against him. So Marie is pretty much going to go along with it, pretending that she believes John is guilty, that he murdered Louise, and they're going to try and get a confession out of Brett that way. So basically, if he helps lead them to Louise's body, or he helps figure out what happened to Louise under the impression that he's telling them that that this is where John put the body, or this is how John killed her. But he's actually like confessing through John, if that makes sense. Like he's saying, this is what John did to her, but it's actually him that did it. They obviously have Brett's house bugged. So Marie goes to his house, has a conversation with him, the whole thing's recorded. And she basically says to him, you know, you're a convicted killer. How would you dispose of the body? And he starts telling her like, you know, do you know how heavy it is to hold a dead body? It's like carrying a sack of potatoes. It's a completely dead weight. And then he goes on to tell her about different scenarios of how to kill someone, where you would dispose of their body, how he would have disposed of Louise's body in the bushes. And so Marie says, right, well, maybe we should go and check the bushes together. And he goes, yeah, okay, let's do it on this date. And he sets a date. And so Marie goes to the police and she tells them he's agreed to go and look in the bushes. He said that's where he would bury a body and we're going to go on this date. So they bug her purse because obviously it's a very dangerous situation. They don't want him to check her for a wire and that it actually be one. So they bug her purse so they can listen to everything that's going on while they're in the bushes alone. It is such a dangerous situation for her to be going into because they are going to be alone in a very remote place where the police won't be able to follow them. And he is a convicted killer. He has killed a woman before. He's also believed to have killed another woman. And now she's going into the bushes alone with him. If he clues on at all that she's working with the police, he could very easily kill her as well before the police have a chance to even get out there to her to save her. So we're in June of 1995 now and Marie and Brett are going out into the forest to search for Louise's body. There are two police surveillance teams following them, but it's a very quiet country road. There's really not any other cars on there, so they really cannot follow too closely or Brett would notice. So Brett drives about one to one and a half hours away and he parks in this very remote area of bushes and then him and Marie set off into the bushes together and like I said the police can't follow them. The bushes are very quiet so if the police were to follow them he would hear them and he would be like why is anyone in this random place of the woods following us? It would be so sketchy. As Marie and Brett get further into the woods, he is sweating. Like he is like dripping sweat. 
and he turns to Marie and he says to her, you know, the only other time I sweat like this is during sex. So obviously like looking for Louise's body is kind of turning him on a little bit. It's like sexually gratifying for him. The forest is also completely silent and Marie is getting pretty nervous because they've walked quite far in. The police are so far away because they can't enter the forest. So if he was going to kill her, that would be it. The police would not be able to help her. And because it's so quiet in the forest, they haven't heard a lot going on in her purse that they'd bugged. So to make sure that she was safe, they actually sent a police helicopter to fly over them to just check that she was all right, which they said they were doing because they wanted to make sure she was okay. Her safety is their first priority. But to me, if her safety is your number one priority, that just doesn't seem like the smartest option. Because if Brett at all starts to think, you know, why is that helicopter flying over here? It's clearly looking for someone. I haven't said anything. You must be working with the police. He could just kill her and the police couldn't do anything about it. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the smartest decision. And he, when he saw that helicopter, he freaked out and he said to her, are you working undercover? Do you have a wire? And she said, no, you know, feel free to search me. And he starts searching her and then he stops and he goes, you know what? I'm not going to search you. I trust you, but I want to get out of here. I'm done searching. And for weeks after that, he refused to go out there again to look for Louise's body because he was so freaked out by the helicopter. So Marie and the detectives come up with a new game plan. They decide that they're going to use Louise's money as bait to get him to confess because he has no money. He has been taking office equipment from Louise's house and pawning it off for money to pay bills, to pay the rent because he has none. So they get someone from the bank to call him and say, you are the heir to her estate. You're going to get everything, but we can't release it to you until she's declared dead and she can't be declared dead until her body is found. To fuel things, they also get Marie to tell Brett over a beer that Louise's ex-boyfriend, John, had taken a polygraph about Louise's murder and he had failed miserably. So he was the prime suspect now. All they needed to do was find Louise's body and John would be donezo. And Brett, he was obviously eating this up, but then he turns to Marie and he says how do I know you're not an undercover cop? And he says this as he's leaning in closer to her. And she said she just knew it was a test that if she wasn't a cop, she would kiss him back. So as he leans in to kiss her, she kissed back. Oh, <laughs> it grosses me out so badly. I don't know how she did it. I physically would not be able to. I would vomit in my mouth and onto him. I couldn't. <laughs> made my, my blood go so cold but I did it and it seemed to put him very much at ease. I mean obviously the police knew about this whole meeting as well. She was still bugged. They had set the whole thing up so they knew that this kiss took place. They were pissed. They called her straight away and they told her you know pretend it's your daughter on the phone and so she's saying things like yeah it's all right you know there's some food in the fridge. I'll be home soon and they're on the phone saying get out of there now. We need to talk and so she tells Brett she's like I really have to go and get home to my daughter but what's going on? Are we going to go and search for Louise's body? And he says, yes, let's do it tomorrow. So she leaves. She goes and meets up with the police who are like, what the heck are you doing? You cannot do that. You can't get any closer to him. You can't let him think that you like him in that way because often going and seeing the scene of a crime like that can be sexual for these people. So you just don't know what's going to happen. If he thinks there's something going on, he might want to kill you too. Anyway, the next day on the 7th of July in 1995, Marie and Brett head back out to the bushes to search for Louise's body. Marie's purse is still bugged and they do have two teams of surveillance following very loosely behind them. So as Marie and Brett are walking through the bushes alone, he's asking her some really bizarre questions. He's asking her, you know, are you nervous to be in the bushes alone with a convicted killer? And he 
he asks her if she trusts him, which she says she does. And it's just very clear that he's like getting off on the whole situation. And then at one point he actually turns to her and he says, hey, just watch out, there's barbed wire just ahead. And she's thinking, how did you know that? Like this guy is not very subtle. I mean, maybe he wasn't trying to be subtle. Clearly he's getting off on the whole situation. So maybe he kind of wants to drop hints that he was the one who killed Louise. So after a little while of walking, Marie notices something out of the corner of her eye and she says to him, what's that over there? And he replies, it's Louise. So Marie gets a little closer and she notices that it's a tennis shoe. And then Brett seems to get almost transfixed. He's staring at Marie and she's kind of freaking out. She's like, what do I do? You know, she obviously has to be really careful here. So she kind of grabs his head and just looks into his eyes and tells him, we found her, it's okay, it's okay, it's all gonna be all right, we found her. And, and he kind of blinks and snaps out of it. And then he goes over to Louise's body and he just starts wailing. You know, he's crying, he's sobbing, he's yelling out Louise's name. And the police can hear through Marie's purse that they're both really emotional. They're both crying. It's just a very intense time. <laughs> I mean, it would have been such an emotional time for Marie because a second ago, you know, the way that he's staring at her, she thought, this is it, I'm gonna die. But she just managed to say the right things in the right tone, in the right way. It would have just been such a relief, but at the same time, they've just discovered the body of this innocent woman who he has murdered. I mean, she would surely just be crying out of relief as well after having to spend months getting close to a convicted killer the relief of knowing that you are never gonna have to talk to this person again would just be insane and you would also just feel relief because you would feel like okay it's over now I'm finally safe so the police don't arrest him right away they leave before Marie and Brett get out of the bushes and Marie and Brett leave as well and then later that afternoon Brett goes into the police station to report that he's found Louise's body thinking that Louise's ex-boyfriend John is gonna get the blame it's all gonna get tied back to him but instead Brett is arrested. Detectives also talk to Marie and ask if she has a message that she wants them to give to Brett. And she tells them to tell Brett, how does it feel to be taken down by a woman? So Brett was obviously taken to trial for the murder of Louise Ellis and he did not admit to anything. He maintained his innocence. Police actually found Louise's diary where she had actually written about the fact that Brett was very abusive toward her during their relationship. Police theorized that on the day of Louise's disappearance on the 22nd of April, that she had been getting ready to go out when Brett came into the bathroom and strangled her to death in the bathtub. He then wrapped her up in the shower curtain, put her body in the back of her own car and drove her out to the bushes where he disposed of her body and he didn't even bother to cover her up. He just put a few branches and twigs over her body and that was it. After this, they believe he drove her car to what he believed was Louise's ex-boyfriend John's cottage and parked her car out the front there, but he'd actually parked it at the wrong cottage. So <laughs> it wasn't John's cottage that he parked it in front of. But they believe that he murdered her and parked her car in front of John's, what he thought was John's cottage so that he could frame her her ex-boyfriend John for her murder. In 1997, Brett Morgan was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He would have been eligible for parole after 25 years. However, two months after sentencing, he died in prison of hepatitis C. Police also believe that he may have been responsible for the unsolved murders of two additional women. But that's all, that's it for me today, guys. As always, I would love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below because I just think this was a really 
really unique and interesting case. Louise obviously saw the best in people. She wanted to see the best in Brett and, you know, she fell in love with a convicted killer. She tried to help him and then in the end, he killed her. The way in which this case was solved as well was really unique and interesting to me because I've just, in all of my time researching cases, I've never researched a case where police worked with kind of just your regular citizen, sent her out in the woods alone with a convicted killer. Like, that is some bravery from Marie. I couldn't do it. So I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments, but I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.